When we think of the subject of the day, the mind of the Dakini, we should consider that the subject is vast enough. And to my way of thinking, almost incomprehensibly vast enough uh, to consider that it isn't likely, really, that we'll cover the whole subject in one afternoon. Because there are so many different ways of understanding what we are about to explore, we have to begin, however, at some point and we should consider then that we are exploring and we are beginning and we are thinking uh, of a certain aspect of the mind of the Dakini. And we should not think that we have truly accomplished the mind of the Dakini. Uh, if any of us feel that, then I think perhaps we have missed the point. But we should think that slowly, slowly, through the virtue of our practice and over a period of time, this understanding will come to us. And so we should tread, I think, gently and uh, in a sensitive way, um, with confidence and yet, I think, with humility. Simply because to understand any aspect of the Buddha, the body, speech, mind, qualities, or activities of the Buddha, to understand anything of the three precious roots, the Lama, the Yidam, or meditational deity, and the Dakini, or Khandro, to understand any one of these is a subject so profound that ultimately, through practice, it will lead to supreme enlightenment. When we think of the mind of the Dakini, it is almost impossible to speak of the subject without speaking of supreme generosity. The two go hand in hand, because according to tradition, the Dakini is considered to be an emanation of the Buddha nature itself and is considered to be actually the activity of the Buddha. The Dakini, or primordial wisdom, female essence, is considered to be uh, the activity of the Buddha's nature. And so, when we look for ourselves at the activity of enlightenment, we cannot look at the activity of enlightenment without considering very deeply the nature of compassion and uh, its, its method. So let us speak then about, first of all, supreme generosity. Before we actually come to the point of discussing the nature of the Dakini, let us speak of supreme generosity. There are three ways, basically, to understand supreme generosity, or to understand generosity at all. The first way to understand generosity is the least favorable. It is the inferior way. And when we understand generosity in the inferior way, we would basically be understanding it in a very superficial or external way. It would be seen in accordance with the usual externalized view that we normally practice. That view which is associated with the belief in self-nature as being inherently real and the belief in the separation between self and other. And coming from this perspective, one would consider generosity in this way, that generosity is an action that, is, that comes from a source and is delivered to a goal. In other words, that it comes from uh, one person and is given to another, that it, that, it, uh, it, that it is an action which has a point of origin and a, an end goal. In thinking of generosity in that way, or of compassion in that way, 
we're not doing anything too unusual. We are maintaining the common view, and that is the view that is dependent on the belief in self-nature as being solid and very real, the view that, uh, that due to that belief in self-nature as being in sol solid and very real, results in the belief in uh, the separation between self and environment. It results in the belief in all of the information given to us by the five senses, and that belief is that all things, all uh, appearances are as the five senses indicate they are, external and separate from self. That is the common view. It is the view that is experienced by all sentient beings, without exception. All sentient beings uh, that are involved on the wheel of cyclic death, death and rebirth that have not achieved enlightenment, feel, perceive, and register their consciousness through the senses. And here in our uh, human realm, these senses are uh, understood as the five senses, and uh, the, the consciousness or perceptual ability that is the accumulation, the assumption, that is due to the activity and the perception of the five senses. All of us experience in that way. Even if we have had excellent moments in our practice, moments that were meaningful and perhaps even profound to us, still all of our experiences rely on externalized perception. There, there is no one here that is free of that kind of perception. We all experience it. It is our common humanity. And although we cannot know this for sure, since we have had no direct experience that we can remember of being any other kind of life, according to the Buddha, all sentient beings have that same kind of experience, although it is modified by the particular karma of their realm of existence. For instance, human beings have the karma to be human, there is a particular karmic fabric or karmic format that has ripened in order to, uh, to uh, uh, result in their humanity. And animals, which we do know exist because we have seen them with our own eyes, and that's generally what causes us to believe in things. Um, they are physical as well. We can assume, we can guess that they feel they react in many of the ways that we react that indicate their feeling. And although we do not have any sense of their, of their consciousness, we can think that they feel and that they are reacting. In other realms of cyclic existence, and the Buddha teaches us that there are other realms of cyclic existence, there are both physical and non-physical forms according to the way we register physical and density, physicalness and density. And in each of these realms, there is a, a separate and, and uh, definite kind of karma, a definite kind of perceptual experience that takes place due to the particular karma of that realm. And, and one, is, one is born into uh, a realm of existence according to one's karma. There are lower realms and there are higher realms. There are realms that are not very enjoyable at all, and there are realms that are extremely enjoyable. And they each have their particular benefits, and they each have perhaps their particular uh, discomforts. When one experiences then, within the context of a certain realm of cyclic existence, one experience is consistent with or according to the particular format of that realm. But always the thing that is felt in common, that is experienced in common, is the, the uh, externalized view and the perception that is the result of 
the need to define and experience self-nature as being separate and real. And according to the Buddha, it is for that reason that desire is considered to be the root cause of all suffering. That having considered oneself to be a self, having considered self-nature to be inherently real, one must then engage in uh, the determination of what self is. One must engage then in creating the continuum of self. One must engage in the perception of self because that is what self is. It is a perceptual situation. It is a perception. When the perception of self ceases, when due to our meditation and due to the development and fine-tuning of our understanding of the Buddha's teaching, we are able to isolate the experience of self and realize that it is in fact only experiential and perceptual. It is at that time through our meditation and our practice that we can perceive the true nature, which is the primordial wisdom state, free of all such conceptions, free of the perceptual process of the continuum of self, free of the belief and the ideation of self-nature. But until that time, all of our experience, every single morsel of it, is based on this belief in self-nature as being inherently real and the compulsion, actually, to continue the definition, the stability, uh, the idea of self. Because once self, one's self has been considered to be real, there is a kind of almost compulsive tension that goes with the need to perpetuate that idea of self. The idea is formed, it becomes necessary, a structure, an artificial structure has been built. The discontinuation of that structure then becomes more chaotic and more effortful than the con continuing of that structure. And so there is a tension that begins and that tension is the root of desire. The desire to continue self, the desire to, to define self, the desire uh, to uh, maintain self becomes actually more and more exaggerated to the degree that one begins to perceive environment in such a way as to hold self. Five, the five senses are born of that. In their primordial wisdom state, in their true state, the five, sen the five senses are the five celestial wisdoms. They are th the pure, uncontrived awareness of nature. The pure, uncontrived awareness of emptiness. They are wisdom. Yet, due to the, the need to continue, the belief in self-nature as being inherently real, due to the, the, the tension and desire and, and uh, that kind of thing to, to continue, uh, the belief in self-nature as being inherently real, the five senses begin to affirm on a continuous basis through developing in such a way that all of one's environment is understood as an extension of self and is understood relative to self. 
If this seems inconceivable, then you have only to look at your perception, and you will see that this must be so. When, for instance, we think of um, hot and cold, we think of hot and cold as relative to self. And I've used this example many times before, but it is worth considering. What is hot to a human being is not hot to a lizard. What is cold to a human being is not cold to a lizard. What is large and small to a human being is not large or small to a caterpillar. All of the, all of the input that we receive through the five senses is a computation that is made on the basis of recognizing self, is made relative to self. And the reason, the, 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 the format, you could say, under which these perceptual abilities have actually developed is through the consideration of self as being inherently real. That is to say that one has already supposed self to be real. And then one sets out, literally, to prove it through one's senses. That is our experience. That is the experience that we are engaged in at this very moment. When we hear things, when we see things, when we smell and taste things. And the exaggerations that come from these perceptual experiences, the conclusions that we come to, the thoughts that we have, the formulas that we develop, uh, the, the philosophies that we adhere to or develop for ourselves. These things we get involved with, we develop, and we continue. as an exaggeration of the process of continuing self. When we think about that, if we really think about this, not just hear it and walk away from it, but if we really consider what that means and let it have its full impact on us, the experience can strike awe into our hearts. Because what have we done if not fill our lives with and base everything we know on the experiences that we have moment by moment and day by day? What have we done by the time we're 40 years old except to draw conclusions? We think of ourselves as having grown up or having learned, but what have we done? We've filled up the computer, and we've read out the data. And we have let different situations formulate our opinions, and different persons formulate our opinions. And have come so far as to think that these opinions are what we are. And we have all done this. We take such pride in our ability to think these things through, such pride in our intellect, such pride in our depth and philosophical understanding, that we even come to the point in our sneaky, quiet little moments when we think no one is listening, when we say, I think, therefore I am. Or I search, therefore I am. Or I'm deep, therefore I am. Or I feel. Therefore, I am. Not understanding that these thoughts, these philosophies, and even these feelings are like a goulash, a beef stew, if you will, made out of all of the different perceptual experiences that we have had in order to prove self-nature to be inherently real, based on an assumption that according to the Buddha is a deluded assumption. According to the Buddha, this self that we contrive, that we think 
is us, this experience that we are having right now, with all of its exaggerations and all of the stuff that goes with it, is actually a deluded experience, that that is not our nature at all. It is a false assumption. And we have been involved in this false assumption since time out of mind. But the Buddha does not say, well, there's nothing, you know, you're nothing. The Buddha doesn't say, simply negate yourself, that you simply don't exist. That is not what the Buddha teaches. And those who think the Buddha has taught that do not understand the Buddha's teachings. Uh, Unfortunately, there have been many that have written about the Buddha's teachings that have said that that is what the Buddha teaches, and it simply isn't so. The Buddha teaches, actually, that there is a nature that, that is the true nature that cannot be understood in terms of understanding something that this nature is not contained within any kind of conceptual framework, no matter how vast. So that you cannot name the nature and say that this is it. Because once you have named something, that is a concept, and it is not that nature. But the Buddha does teach us that this nature has the quality of innate wakefulness, awareness. Awareness that is not like the, the awareness that we understand. In fact, in our farthest flung meditations, in our really out there experiences, no matter what we have experienced, when we have experienced awareness, until we reach supreme enlightenment, it is a specific awareness. It is an awareness from something to something. It is an awareness about something. It is a specific awareness, even if, that, that, even if it is much more subtle than the, the very limited and gross awareness that we normally experience. But the kind of awareness that is our true nature is absolutely free of even the most gossamer remnants of ideation. There is no specific subject and object. Not even in the most gossamer way, in the most subtle way, This awareness, then, cannot really be understood by our intellects. Yet it is our nature. And it is no less our nature now than it will be when we realize it, when we awaken to it and become ourselves Buddhas. And yet, Perhaps for many of us, there has never been a time when we have known it less. This nature is described in its awareness as having the quality of luminosity that the awareness is more like luminosity than it is like specific awareness. Simply because when we think of luminosity, we think of something that, that has nature. We think of something that is not devoid. We think of something that is dynamic and yet we do not understand luminosity. And that's why luminosity is a good word to use, and that's why it has been used, so that we can intuit something without trying to understand it, and therefore crystallize it and ruin it 
with our brains, with our minds. And so that awareness is called luminosity. One can look at relative existence, at all of the myriad of experiences that we enjoy, at all of the many perceptions that we engage in. One can look at all of the objects alone that are part of our experience, and then even think about the many thoughts and different kinds of internal experiences that we have had. And we know simply from seeing that, for simply from seeing the, 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 the multiplicity of experience and phenomena, we can tell from that that our nature is not something black and void and empty in the way we understand empty, that is to say, as the opposite of full. That's the only way we understand empty. We can see from the multiplicity of, of experience, from, the, from the, the amazing volume of phenomena, and know that our nature is not a vacuum because all things that we experience arise from that nature. It is the mother of all experience that we have. It cannot be separate. The experience that we're having cannot be separate from our nature or someone else would be having it. That's a joke. <laughs> but it's actually quite true. that we have this experience, that the experience is real to us, that it continues in its extravagance, is an indication of the great depth and breadth and profundity of the sphere of truth, which is the mother of all phenomena, that which is our nature. And yet every experience that we have still continues to come from the belief in self-nature as being inherently real, the belief in phenomena as being external, the exaggeration of all the conclusions and, and, and continuation of all the input that we develop from continuing this idea, and yet, and, and this, this experience, this superficial experience of externalization, continues. And we have then no taste of the natural state no taste of our true primordial wisdom nature. And so it is because of that that we have and hold an extremely superficial view. Now I've just taken us on a long journey to talk about all these great things. But do you remember that we spoke of a way of understanding compassion? And we were trying to think of uh, three different levels on which supreme generosity or compassion can be understood. What I have done now is to sort of manipulate us through a little experience or a little talk or whatever you would like to call it in order to indicate how it is that every thought we have at this moment about what supreme generosity must be about is based on this false assumption of self-nature, is based on a lack of awareness of our own true nature, and therefore the understanding that we have of supreme generosity, of compassion, is a very externalized, 
and very superficial view. It is subject and object based. It is understood in such a way that it will cause us to think of generosity as a set of rules that one might follow. And in order to understand and to practice generosity in that way, one would have to have guidelines, one would have to have rules. It would be like a moral code. I hope that by the time we com complete our work together today, we might have moved beyond that because utilizing the idea of supreme generosity simply in that way is not enough. It makes for an inferior experience. It makes for a lesser accomplishment. It is too superficial. It results in the very ordinary kind of practice that might be engaged in if one decided one wished to be a spiritual person. Then one could go around acting like a spiritual person. And in acting like a spiritual person, one does not truly change. Something is left. And the reason why is that the one who wishes to be a spiritual person still remains deluded by the egocentric idea. So the wishing to be a spiritual person is not consistent with the mind of the Dakini. It is not consistent with a deeper practice. And in fact, it is not consistent with supreme enlightenment. Yet, one can have some results. In truth, one can have some results simply by accomplishing uh, some meritorious cause and effect phenomena, that is to say, good karma. If we were to begin now to go out and feed the hungry and heal the sick, in some future time, that benefit would ripen. And we perhaps would have someone help us. Perhaps at some future time, we would experience being fed and being It is a fruit that results in one's spiritual progress. Definitely, it leads one, leads one closer to enlightenment as it is the antidote to selfish behavior and desire. And that is quite true. It is beneficial and uh, what is the word that I want? Desirable. Maybe it's not the word I want. <laughs> but I, with license, I will use the word desirable. In that, it produces the relaxation of one's compulsive concentration on one's own needs. It produces the relaxation of that which produces suffering. Because selfishness, concentration on one's own needs to the exclusion of others, produces the affirmation or reaffirmation of the deluded belief in self-nature as being inherently real. It produces and increases that inner tension associated with desire. And it tends to increase itself. Desire tends to increase itself. The, de the more desire acted upon, the more desire is actually experienced in one's mind stream. It isn't the opposite, contrary to our uh, uh, common understanding. The more one satisfies one's desire, the more one experiences desire within one, in, one, in one's mind stream. On the other hand, 
yeah, the more one acts kindly and with loving kindness and unselfishly, then the more one experiences the relaxation of needfulness and grasping. Of course, this is very hard for us to view because all we can think of is very immediate result. And the very immediate result we learn in things uh, that are consistent with, for instance, our physical bodies. Um, let's say if I'm thirsty, I learn that if I drink water, that thirst will be finished. It will be solved. And so, from a conclusion like that, I have the idea in my mind that if I feel that I need something and I take that something, or I have it, or I have it, I get it for myself, or even if it means taking it away from someone else, if I get it for myself, then that immediate need will be solved. And actually, it's true. We experience that immediate need being solved. But what we don't realize is that in place of that immediate need pop up, millions of other little baby needs that grow up to be big needs over time. That they actually develop in such a way as to beat the heck out of their parent needs and become more and more obvious and obnoxious. And it just never ends. So that's the part that we seem to miss because we are uh, a people that have developed the 30-minute sitcoms, you see, that always resolve within 30 minutes. And if we have the capacity to develop 30-minute sitcoms, then we have the capacity for immediate gratification. And that's a very important indication of where we're at. You should think about that when you watch TV. An hour at the outside can solve most life crises. And there is no next week. It simply is a new, new picture next week. That's just the way we think. Watching what we watch on TV is such a good indication. It's a wonderful way to watch the nature of your mind because it's exactly how we experience our lives. We do not realize that desire actually increases itself, gives birth to itself, nurtures itself, supports itself, reproduces itself. Always. So, it is beneficial to practice in such a way that we accomplish a great deal of virtuous activity, activity that is of benefit to sentient beings. And within the context of that kind of practice, one practices both temporary and absolute uh, uh, virtuous activity or compassion compassionate activity. Temporary uh, compassionate activity is that activity which is immediately beneficial and which is beneficial for some temporary time. For instance, the temporary helping of another person, the, the, uh, even to solve a specific problem that seems to be permanently solved. Um, the problem of hunger, the problem of sickness, the problem of um, poverty. These things are actually temporary problems according to the Buddha's teaching because the Buddha does not see us as having simply one lifetime. The Buddha sees us as a continuum of many different lifetimes, constantly a revolution within cyclic existence. And that even the solving of the problems of one lifetime, even all of them, and even solving them until the time of one's death, the Buddha considers that to be temporary solution. So even if, for instance, we could find a way th as, our, as part of our practice to feed all the hungry of the world, and I sincerely hope that we can find a way to do that, um, and to house all the homeless of the world, and to heal all of the sick of the world until the time of their death, according to the Buddha, we cannot follow them into the bardo state. We cannot follow them into their next incarnation. We cannot be sure that where they are next, they will not again be hungry 
and homeless and poor. We cannot assure that. So the Buddha considers that all of the things that we do are beneficial and we should do them, but they are temporary. And we should actually put our emphasis on solving the problems of sentient beings permanently. Solving them forever. And to solve them forever, one must solve them at their root, at their foundation. And that is then the elimination of desire. And according to the Buddha, all of the ways in which we experience our lives, the joyful ways and the ways that are suffering, come from our karma, from our past karma. Everything that we've experienced in this lifetime really doesn't come from the way our parents treated us. It really doesn't come from what our, our, uh, the fact that uh, daddy was never home and uh, mother was working. And it really didn't come from all of the different uh, things that we blamed them on. They actually came, even the one about daddy being never home and mother always working, came from the karma that remains within seed form within our minds and is actually, what we're seeing is the ripening of a series of cause and effect relationships that are interdependent and that arise interdependently and ripen in many, actually randomly. And the, the experience we have is actually that ripening. And according to the Buddha, therefore, in order to solve the problems of sentient beings, one has to pacify the ripening, and one does that through practice and meditation. Then one has to cut out the cause of that ripening at its root. Therefore, one has to dismember karma, cause and effect relationship, through one's practice. And the very root of that, one must purify the mind of all desire. And it is through that practice and purification that all of the problems of sentient beings are solved. And it is when a desire is completely pacified, cause and effect relationship becomes dormant, it, it rests because there is no, uh, because one perceives the primordial wisdom state and does not perceive self-nature and external phenomena uh, in that schismed way that, that one perceives it now. It is not perceived in an, an external way. One experiences simply one's nature and the mind is at rest. In that state, one experiences awakening. One experiences one's true nature. One experiences enlightenment. And it is that enlightenment which is the cessation of all suffering permanently. Simply the cessation of all suffering. And that, that is the, the ultimate solution. Yet understanding compassion in that way, merely as a way to accumulate merit and virtuous activity so that one can benefit others and benefit oneself in order to, to achieve enlightenment, it is a very good, it is an excellent way to understand how to practice, yet it is not the ultimate way to understand how to practice. Still in all, even though that is a most profound and excellent understanding, it should be considered an intermediate understanding. And having arrived at that conclusion, which actually one does after a great deal of effort and, and effortful consideration of the Buddhist philosophy and of the meaning of enlightenment and of the meaning of cyclic existence, of, of the, the, the nature of cyclic existence, after an effortful consideration of that, and that is what it takes, one should still understand that there is more to look for, that there is still a more profound level of understanding that one should reach. And what we're going to do now is to take our lunch break. 
And uh, then we are going to come back and, understand, and, and discuss the ultimate view of supreme generosity. And in discussing that, one will arrive at a better understanding of the mind of the Dakini. And the reason being that all of the considerations that we have discussed thus far, the consideration of uh, considering generosity to be a subject and object uh, reality, a divided reality, a very superficial reality, and, and even to consider it a set of moral codes, and then to go on even to consider uh, supreme generosity to be a way to accumulate virtue and merit so that one can achieve realization in order to benefit beings. These ideas are thought of in relation to self. The self is considered in order to understand these. The basis for these thoughts is the belief in self-nature as being inherently real. I will benefit others. I will achieve enlightenment for their sake. There is still the assumption of self. And so the entire mandala, the entire emanation of this thought activity is based on the belief in self-nature as being inherently real. It arises from that presupposition. Whereas the, the view of the Dakini, the view of supreme generosity in its most ultimate sense, does not arise from that supposition, but instead arises from the primordial wisdom state, from the very nature of emptiness itself. <laughs>